Why is he holding a, a staff with, uh, with, snake, with serpents on it as a symbol of healing? Why is commerce being associated with healing? It's kind of interesting right there. Anybody know what a staff with one serpent is? It's not a caduceus. It has another name. Well, I, I mean, I've always looked at that from an Eastern perspective of being complete because they, sure. they talk about the serpent power. Sure. And the central uh, Shoshona, which is the middle, and then you have the Yedek and Yigala that circles around the spine. So I always see that, you know, sometimes I'll see the Caduceus with one snake and then sometimes two like the next. Right. The, the one with one is called the Rod of Asclepius. And the Rod of Asclepius is also a symbol of healing and medicine as well. I think he's like a son of Apollo, but don't quote me on that. But I find it interesting, too, that, that in ancient India, you know, basically that they would say is that the healing comes through the spine because that's what energy is flowing through the body. I so, love that. I uh, love so that. I, when I see the caduceus, I always think that that's really a symbol of healing force. But when we talk about healing, you're talking about distribution of energy in the body to fix things. And what's that in the middle? You said it's the shashuna, but what is it? What is he holding commonly? What most everybody would say? You got the two serpents and a staff, right? Isn't there a story about, okay, first thing, you see how the staff is kind of like nice and upright and straight, and the serpents are kind of crooked, right? When we say something's crooked, or someone's crooked, we say they're a crook. And then we have, who holds the crook? The Pharaoh. Also, we've got the staff, which is straight, the serpent is crooked, and we have a, may, um, we can personify this into the story of Cain and Abel. And Abel means breath, and Cain means um, a cane, right? A rod or a staff. And the cane, rod, or staff also can be um, viewed as like the prana, right? It's that tube that's going right through us, the axis. And so, and, and, uh, so Cain is the cane here, and, and Abel's breath, and in the Bible, in the, older, in the older scriptures, before they used the word killed, they used the word slew, S-L-E-W, which means to twist. And they say that Cain slew his brother Abel. So we have something about the staff twisting the breath, which kind of reminds me of Kundalini as well. Whoops. Something interesting also is that we, uh, another uh, way we use the word staff is in music. It's this unmoving straight line. Right? And then we have the musical notes which kind of flow along it, right? And if you were to like, you know, view the way music moves, it would kind of move something like a serpent, right? Something like that. Now, 
if we view the 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 cane as like this straight upright thing and the serpent is crooked and kind of like symbol of evil in a way right so we say cane is good serpent is evil which one would be which which one would be right versus wrong or right versus left if you exercise your right is that the cane is the cane upright and straight anybody associate being left-handed with the devil back in the day and they tried to make you left-handed people right right-handed because they thought my mom was raised in the and she was born left-handed and they took it out oh okay okay so so something that some symbolism we might have there is that the cane represents your right like your right hand which is spelled the same way as a right that you exercise were you going to say something else no okay and then the serpent as something left okay um which is kind of interesting we kind of associate one of those with receiving and giving as well i think it varies from culture to culture um but also there's also a story in the bible about a cain being turned or transmuted into a serpent anybody remember that uh, so just in front of the pharaoh and, and what was? Do you remember what he was able to do differently than the than the magicians, or was it the sorcerers, of Pharaoh's sorcerers? He throws his cane on the ground. The cane turns into a serpent, and then he brings up like the I think the name was like sorcerers of the magicians, and they take all their canes and throw it on the ground, and they turn into serpents. And what happens? His serpent eats all the others. His serpent eats all the others, and then it also turns back into a cane again. So there's this idea of changing something that's, that's, that's wavy or crooked or changing a, a snake into, a, into something straight, something crooked into something straight, or something straight into something crooked. And it's also being used to symbolize medicine or healing or remedy, which is the exercise of a right to achieve a balance. So lots of symbolism we can draw off of good old Hermes over there. Go to the next slide. Okay. This is a code from uh, the Uniform Commercial Code, which is adopted by most every state. I have yet to find a state that hasn't adopted the Uniform Commercial Code. If you want to view the Uniform Commercial Code, you could simply, and in California, you could simply go Google California Law. First page will be the page that lists all the California law, and you'll see a word. It says commercial code, you click on that button, hit OK or search or whatever it is, and you will have the entire UCC codified through the state of California. And so if we have something called commerce, which is the exchange of something, which also signifies that there's at least two, two people going on, or Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, exchanging energy or information, and we have um, some, a, a code called the uniform commercial code, what's it doing? It's unifying exchange under one tongue, under one language. Okay, so the definitions in here are contract, agreement, contract for sale, sale, present sale, conforming to contract, termination and cancellation. In this article, unless the context otherwise requires, Contract and agreement are limited to those relating to the present or future sale of goods. Contract for sale includes both a present sale of goods and a contract to sell goods at a future time. A sale consists in the passing of title from the seller to the buyer for a price. Is there sales going on as we speak? Is our breath an active sale? So anytime there's something being exchanged from one position to another, can we safely say that there's a sale taking place? Okay, we're gonna learn how to, or we're gonna throw out some ideas of how to take anything intangible like that that you can see, because there's a lot of intangible sales going, going on, and then we have physical sales that are going on. And we wanna be able to take that value that's being exchanged and fully manifest it in our world where we can turn it into any form that we deem fit, including Federal Reserve notes, okay? And that's an act of transmutation. It's a form of alchemy. 
Okay, so we have this a sale that's consisting in the passing of title from the seller to the buyer for a price. And we have a present sale, which means a, sa a sale which is accomplished by the making of a contract. So does anybody have any idea what the difference is between a sale and a present sale? For instance, we we'll would do an example, like a mortgage or something, okay? Or, well, it's not necessarily a mortgage, but we'll do a contract that maybe you guys, I'm selling my house to you guys. You guys are a little collective community. I want to sell my house to you guys. So the whole idea here, the end result is that we want me to pass the title of the house to your guys' community, right? And that would be the sale. But in doing so, we're going to have to make a contract, okay? To help facilitate the exchange, it'll be a bond, It'll help facilitate the exchange of energy from my position, from my fiction's position, to your fiction's position, okay? And in that contract, there is a present sale that, is, that the UCC is distinguishing from the sale itself, okay? Now this right here, we could say that this is an act of monetization or fractionalization. It's an act of reflecting value. And, and by the way, when value is reflected, I mean, Usually we kind of look in commerce as like, when you divide something, let's say there's one, one share of something, and we are divided into two, we would say something like, one person has how much worth? How much? One unit. One unit. Or like they would say like 50% is yours, 50% is yours. If two people were sharing, let's say one share, they would say I own half and the other person owns half. But in nature, is that how it really works? For instance, when a mother has a child, is the mother split in half? In some way, right? But at the end result is what? You took one and made two, right? Or a flower, one flower has, it's pollinated, produces seeds. Those seeds are reflections of the flower. Does the flower become, if it has 100 seeds, does that flower become 100th of a flower? No, it stays one whole flower and it has 100 seeds, and those 100 seeds can go out and make 100 new flowers, right? If they're all, you know, in good shape. So that idea of when, when value is reflected, that there is nothing lost. Another good example is cell division, right? Or, uh, uh, when a cell divides from one into two, it's not a half and a half. It's one cell, one cell, right? So that's how nature works. And that's actually how banking works as well, okay? Every time something moves, there is a new account. And if you recognize the value of that account, then you can reap the benefits. But if you don't recognize the value of it, you may take that account and put it to the side. I'll give you one great example of moving an account to a side is when you get a receipt. How many people have said, no thanks, I don't need a receipt? No, you guys keep all your receipts? Hell yeah, all right. What happens if you were to lose your receipt? Did you lose the value? No, you lost the thing that represented the value. Because the value is actually something that's intangible, right? And what we do is we make a piece of paper that represents the value, because a piece of paper is just a symbol. It's a symbol that represents the value. So we'll go more into stuff like that in, in banking and kind of go through maybe a little scenario of how we're moving these pieces of paper around and how maybe we may, if, if we take a closer look at what's going on, we can recognize a higher level of value that's being exchanged in our daily transactions and what you guys are already doing every day, we may be able to recognize that actually the value is multiplying. And in recognizing that, there might be some parties of interest that might be really interested in the value multiplying. If you can see it that way, there's going to be other, there's other entities out there that are willing, are willing to see it that way as well. And, and what you're doing there is you're changing the way you're accounting for something. One man's trash is another man's treasure, right? This is worthless to me. Throw it out here. All of a sudden, someone picks it up, and they're like, oh, this is just what I need. So what if that's going on in our, in our commerce, commercial system right now? Okay, so let's go to this next sentence here. Goods or conduct, including any part of a performance, are conforming or conform to the contract when they are in accordance with the obligations under the contract. Anybody got a definition for conform real quick? Adapt. Adapt? What's con? Prefix con? Against. With. With? 
form. With form. With form. It's within the form. It's within the guidelines of the contract. Okay? I'm going to show you something uh, really interesting about contracts in just a second here. Um, we're going to get through two more definitions. These next two definitions are the opposites of one another. Remember how I was talking about contraction and expansion and how both opposites, both polar opposites of any given uh, pole are existing at the same time. And we kind of tune our perspective to see it one way or the other, or both, or neither, right? Termination occurs when either party pursuant to a power created by agreement or law puts an end to a contract otherwise than for its breach. On termination, all obligations which are still executory on both sides, or is that executory, on both sides are discharged, but any right based on prior breach or performance survives. Okay, so we see here in termination that basically it's parties putting an end to a contract without breach. That's the key word right there. Remember we're talking about turning evil into good and good into evil with the serpent and the staff? Okay. Cancellation occurs when either party puts an end to the contract for breach by the other. And its effect is the same as that of termination, except that the canceling party also retains any remedy for breach of the whole contract or any uninformed or unperformed balance. So the key word here is termination is when the contract ends when, as a result of there being no breach. And cancellation is when the contract is put an end, uh, there's, we put an end to a contract when there is breach. Now the magic word there is breach. Okay, what is breach? See, most of us, mo most people I think would just kind of scan over this definition, like, oh, I gotta memorize this code here. I wanna learn the commercial code. I wanna learn how to use negotiable instruments. I wanna learn how to recognize the value of these pieces of paper that most people don't recognize the value of. They probably read that and they're like, oh, breach means someone who doesn't follow along the guidelines of a contract, and so the contract is, is it doesn't work anymore. See that kind of definition? But really, what is, what is, if someone say you breach a contract, what's a synonym, a quick synonym? Break. Break, right. But there's this idea about breaking bread. And what happened when there wasn't, when there was like a loaf of bread or something like that, and it wasn't enough to feed everybody? Do you guys remember that? Oh, what happened? How, what, how did you do that? Right, you fractionalized the bread, right? You monetize it. Fractionalize the bread so that there was enough to feed everybody, right? So this idea of breach and break, and when you break your arm, what's another word for it? Fracture. Yeah, fracture, right? Now we're dealing with fracture. What, what else has that, has that little, that root, F-R-A-C-T? Fraction. Fractal. Fractal. Cool. So you see here, cancellation is a contract ending as a result of fractionalization. Maybe not what most of us would think, just a quick glance trying to research and study and memorize you know, for a law, a law test or something. It's got a lot of color in it. Uh, go ahead to the next slide. Okay, so there we go, breach, the breaking or violating of a law. By the way, just quick real quick, because we see breaking and may, you may look at that word violate and start uh, coming up with some interesting ideas. What's that first word? V I O L A. It's an instrument, right? Viola. Yeah. But also uh, violet, right? Which, if we were looking at the chakra system, it would be the crown. Just a couple things to point out there. See uh, the second definition. It says in injury, which you can just break down into injury, right? and infringement, which also means break. So we have, anyway, let's go back to breach. The breaking or violating of a law, right, or duty, either by commission or omission, which means, what, committing an act or not committing an act, right? Okay, and so we have the breaking of law. Imagine that might be a little bit similar to the breaking of bread. Violation, injury, infringement, breach of rights. Again, breaking right, fractionalizing right. Duty or law, ravishment, seduction, ooh, seduction. Now we're getting into that fic those fiction words, it seems like, right? Deception, seduction, fraction, a breaking or breaking up, a fragment 
or broken parts, a portion of a thing less than the whole. Okay, portion is an interesting word, which we could say is a second cousin to breach, because we went from breach to violate, or we went from breach to break, from break to fraction, right? And by the way, the fraction definition and the breach definition and the violation, those are all Black's Law 4th edition. Okay, Black's Law Dictionary. So, broken apart, we have part, portion. If I said I was to give you your portion, what's another way to say that? Say it? Share. Your share, okay. And what's another word for share? Allotment. Allotment, my piece, part. My, my part, right? My parcel. Uh-oh, now we're getting into property. So what happens when, what, when a contract is breached? What's the, what's the first thing that happens when a contract is breached? Well, uh, a new, new pieces of paper are created, yeah, right? Paper. Someone files a suit, right? Suit. Right? Anybody know what the name Sue means? When you sue somebody, it's the name of a girl, right? <laughs> right? And then suit is like suits of cards, right? It's a, it's a brand new account number, right? And it's all this value from this other contract was just deposited into this new suit. It's another move of fractionalization. If we just recognize the fraction, and in fact, if you get a summons in the court, one of the common words you'll see is that you are, that the defendant is invited to participate. And we're gonna see here, right here, go UCC 8-102, number 15, the definition of the word security, except as otherwise provided in section 8-103, means an obligation of an issuer, a share, a participation, or other interest in an issuer or in property or in an enterprise of an issuer. Okay, so if, if uh, you are in summons to court and they're asking you to participate in any way, shape, or form, do you have a share? Okay, so how many of us go in, go in there though and we fully recognize the value of our share? I bet you we could sell that share if we really wanted to. I wonder how much it would be worth if it was broken off of, of uh, the case, the suit, the suit was one whole, and then one of the little children that came was that summons. That summons was 100% was entitled to who? Who gets a summons to court? Plaintiff? Defendant? Defendant gets a summons to court, right? Is, is the plaintiff obligated to, to, to make sure that the defendant issues or to, that the defendant receives a summons into court yeah. right it's called service of process and there's this excuse that you have if you never got a summons it's called insufficient service of process okay and it's a, it's a defense that you have to where they can't proceed any further because you have been served with your share how many people go into the court with their summons and try to sell it. No, most people just, they see the summons as something maybe unfavorable, right? You guys uh, remember that back in the Renaissance, in the Renaissance when you were invited to court, was it a good thing or a bad thing? During the Renaissance, when you were invited, it was a good thing. When you're invited to see the king and queen, you guys ever watched like uh, Stage Beauty or Shakespeare in Love or anything about the Renaissance? What? My mom watched the Tudors. The Tudors. You guys all anybody seen the Tudors in here? No? The Tudors about King Henry? Was it King Henry the Henry VIII? Henry the Eighth. King Henry the Eighth, right? And, and when you're summoned to the court, the court operates a little bit differently there. There's gestures, there's um, there's music. There's dancing. It does, doesn't it? It's really twisted here, huh? The serpent has a very interesting role in our courts of record here, right? But at the end of the day, we still have the same kind of situation taking place. But that's kind of like the big idea that I have is, is I'd like to help bring out the Renaissance theme of courts and kind of bring that into back into view, you know? So where when you're coming into court, you got your trumpets, you know? You've got your gesture you're coming in, you've got, you know, your and all the different colors and stuff like that. 
and, and maybe maybe everybody's going to benefit out of you being there. And maybe it's going to be, and also uh, uh, holding court, there's usually multiple nations involved, multiple countries. It's, it becomes something more of an international affair. And in international affairs, you have customs, right? And you don't want to just come in here and say, these are my customs. You can't tell me what to do. These are my customs. And, and that's it, because I govern myself. Well, if you're going into this court over here, you might want to recognize the customs of that court. You don't just go into someone's house and say, and you know, and, and not check in with their customs, or otherwise you could offend the host. You know, so you want to be sensitive to the, so being governing, self-governing doesn't necessarily mean you don't have to respect the customs of other fictions out there, of other entities. So keep that in mind. Let's read this definition of fractal real quick from Wikipedia. Fractal is a mathematical set that has a fractal dimension that usually exceeds its topological dimension and may fall between the integers. Fractals are typically self-similar patterns where self-similar means they are the same from near as from far. It sounds like as above, so below to me, I don't know. Fractals may be exactly the same at every scale or as illustrated in figure one, which we don't have here, they may be nearly the same at different scales. Okay, scales. Again, serpent and music. The notes on a scale. Or as illustrated in figure one, they may be nearly the same at different scales. Okay, the definition of fractal goes beyond self-similarity per se to exclude trivial self-similarity and include the idea of a detailed pattern repeating itself. So now... What's going on in nature? We, you know, it's kind of a, a huge theme right now, running around. Who created the word fractal? Anybody co realize who coined that word? Was it Mandelbrot? Was it Mandelbrot? Mandelbrot set. Mandelbrot set. Yeah, I think it, I think it actually was. I think there was a quote that I read the other day. I think it was in, actually etymology that said something about that. So, if if we have this fractal nature as above, so below. Okay. There's these two perspectives that we have of what a bill is. We get bills in the mail, but we also have these dollar bills in our pocket. And we also have the entire country is funded off of T bills. Of bills. Oh, T bills. That's a great, great word drop there. We have we have these bills that are funded. About twelve appropriation bills are passed every year. And off those bills, when they're when they're Created, what, what does a bill turn into? When it kind of going through its growing phase, a bill is kind of one of the beginning stages of what? A law. A law. How many of you guys go, when you get your bills in the mail, you make sure that you take the necessary steps to turn that bill into a law? Oh, nice. Okay. So yeah, so yeah, there's, there's something going on here that when we get a bill in the mail that, that maybe we can go ahead and turn that into a law. What does it take to create a law? Okay, just a signature. Okay, what if I go ahead and I sign a bill and I, I, I adopt it like I, I, like, I, like I was the president? But I didn't let anybody know about it. It requires cooperation. Why is cooperation? Yes. Agreement. Beautiful. Agreement. Agreement. Contract. Meeting of the minds. What? Meeting of the minds. Meeting of the minds. Okay. So a bill is like a contract, right? It's a meeting of the minds when it's turned into a law. Okay. Now, is there any laws out there? We have these, this idea of private and public that we'll go into, but if we want the people to recognize the people of a state of consciousness, we want the collective to recognize something that we have in our house. Let's say we just got this bill in the mail and we accept it. Is it in a level? Is it a public law or private law at that point? Private law. It's like super private because the, the, even the person who sent you the bill doesn't even know. But how do you let somebody know that you accepted their bill? Give them a notice, right? You just kind of give them some type of communication to let them know that they've that uh, you've accepted the bill. But also, you may want to let the people know that you've accepted the bill. Otherwise, the law stays private. What's a huge disadvantage of private law? The people can't see it, hence they can't respect it. And that's the big word right there. We have in the First Amendment of the Constitution of the United States. Right? Is that Congress shall respect no law establishing, or I'm sorry, we shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion. Right? So, 
if they can't respect it, they can't see it. Anybody who's, uh, anybody ever heard of uh, someone going into court with their private contract and the judge says, I don't know what you're talking about? They act like it doesn't even exist. Why? Because they have the eye of the people. And if the people can't see it, neither can the judge. Okay, so another word I just wanted to kind of throw out there right here is when you break something, we can say it's broke. Well, broking or brokering um, is this middleman here, an agent employed to make bargains and contracts for compensation. It's kind of another Holy Ghost position, is a broker. So again, anytime a contract is, is broken, there are new contracts that are being created always. Okay, go ahead, next slide. Okay, we just got some synonyms here for uh, contract. We've got definition, agreement, deal, synonyms, an arrangement. Where do we see arrangement? Um, do you remember we're talking about how the senses, when there's all this information kind of passing to the senses, and that the senses kind of, they interpret the information that's otherwise neutral, but the way, what they do to, to what they do the information is they separate one bit of information from another by a form of, they classify it, right? This is a square piece, this is a circle, right? That's classification, another name for that is taxonomy, right? In biology, we use taxonomy so that we can properly identify something, break something apart, break apart into pieces to see how it works, okay? So that word tax, you know, if you kind of look at the history of the word tax, we kind of, on one level, we see that it means tribute. You know, it kind of goes back in the days of Caesar, but it also means taxonomy. And in tax, we're dealing with classification. So if you're looking at when you report your taxes, and you, know, you kind of notice usually there's like one simple line for your income. I mean, basically, where like the, if you say you make $100,000, IRS is like, cool, we'll tax you on 100 grand. No problem. It's like, we believe you, right? But what's that part where the kind of IRS needs a little bit more? The expenses.